Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second or third MBTI uh, webinar. Today we have Nicholas Kalias, uh, and today he is with the organism, Organisms in Chicago Underways. Um, go ahead, take it away, uh, Mr. Kalias. All right. Hi, how's it going? I'm Nicholas Kolias, an aquatic biologist at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the biological monitoring that we do in the Chicago area waterways. Um, so let me just uh, start by sharing my screen. All right. Um, I hope everybody can uh, see my screen here. All right. So I'm going to start by giving a brief history of the um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Chicago. And then I'll talk about some of the programs and projects that we do um, here. So what is the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. The district was established in 1889 as the Sanitary District of Chicago, created to address the pollution crisis stemming from our water supply. We were created because storms were flushing polluted river water into the lake. In 1919, the Board of Commissioners passed an ordinance committing the district to the construction and operation of sewage treatment plants to protect and preserve Lake Michigan, our source of drinking water for Chicago, Cook County communities and neighboring communities. The district also is also aimed to improve water quality in its water courses in its service area, protect businesses and homes from flood damage and manage water as a vital resource for its service area. The service area is about 882 882 square miles of Cook County, Illinois. The boundaries of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District include more than 5 million residents. These people, plus thousands of industries within the district, generate 1.4 billion gallons of wastewater each day. The district is divided into seven service areas. Each sends its wastewater to a different treatment plant through the sewer system. These seven plants range in capacity from 2.3 million gallons per day at our Lamont plant, to 1.44 billion gallons per day at the Stickney plant, the world's largest wastewater treatment plant, with an overall design capacity of over 500 billion gallons per year. In 2022, over 400 billion gallons of water was treated at the district plants. That's equivalent to 750,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. In the early days of Chicago's history, the Chicago River flowed into Lake Michigan. Note the intake cribs of our drinking water near where the rivers would discharge into the lake. This could cause problems when the city's drinking water comes from the lake. So the district decided to reverse the flow of the river and send the waste route water down the Des Plaines River and into the Illinois River and eventually the Mississippi River. This required digging and excavating large channels and canals that would flow by gravity, connecting the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River, roughly along the path of the portage used by Native Americans and early settlers. Lake Michigan would flow into the river at the mouth, diluting the pollution. Here is a diagram showing uh, excavation of the canals. Um, it would flow by gravity from the lake down the canals and connect to the rivers downstream. Here are some of the early engineers of the Sanitary District of Chicago that took on this Herculean task. Here are, is another historical picture of some of the work being done to excavate the canals. We were established in 1889 um, to Excuse me. address do you have your uh, are you um are you sharing your screen right now yes oh we can't see it you can't see it no nah. oh let me see it's 
There's a there's a green share button at the bottom of the screen, uh, right next to record and chat. Yep. There we go. Perfect. Can you see? Uh, is it a big, big screen of? Yeah, we can see it now. All right. Uh, let me see. I'll uh, back up a couple slides just to uh, show some of the uh, diagrams. Um, here we go. Yeah, so as you can see, here are the intake cribs for the drinking water, uh, which is right by the uh, rivers going into the lake, which you can see all of this pollution right near the intake cribs. And that was causing a lot of disease for the residents of Chicago. Here's the diagram uh, I was talking about before where they would have to excavate a channel for the water from the lake to flow and reverse the uh, flow of the river to go downstream. Here are some of the uh, engineers and some, some historical photos of excavation being completed. Um, here's a few more. I just threw these in there because I thought they were pretty interesting. A lot of rock was needed to be excavated in order to create these channels and canals. Here you can see um, more of the canal being dug. And here in 1899, uh, during construction in the winter, you can see people ice skating down the, uh, the canal before it was finished and completely filled with water. Here are some more historical photos. And here is a photo of dynamite being used to blast through a lot of the rock. Oops. And in back in those days, they thought the solution to pollution was dilution. So just add lake water and send it downstream. And the district completed construction of the Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal in 1900, followed by the North Shore Channel in 1910 and the Cal Sag Channel, which was constructed in 1922. So again, here is the rivers and takes before excavation of the river flowing into the lake. And here are the rivers with the flow reversed, showing that the San Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, as well as subsequent two channels, North Shore Channel and Cal Sag Channel, the North Shore Channel was excava excavated to provide drainage to the marshy areas north of the city and direct lake water into the north branch of the Chicago River for dilution. The Cal Sag Channel right here reversed the flow of the Calumet River system to prevent pollution from reaching the lake and provide drainage. However, the solution to pollution is not dilution. We needed to treat wastewater before returning it to the waterways. So in the 1920s and 30s, the district built seven treatment plants and intercepting sewers to collect sewage and send it to the plants to address the growth of the region. By the 1950s, the MWRD was capturing roughly a billion gallons of combined sewage and stormwater per day. Once we had reversed the flow of the river, our drinking water source was protected, but it was the invention of wastewater treatment that would eventually serve to improve our water environment to new levels. Here, the MWRC, MWRD staff are working to develop the processes in 1923. I won't go into detail on how wastewater is treated because I believe someone from our microbiology section is speaking to you this afternoon. So I'll just tease it and say that microorganisms play a large role in cleaning up the waste. After the water is treated by one of our plants, Stickney, pictured here, one of the largest in the world. Um, the water or effluent is discharged into the rivers. And this is where I come in. I work as 
and aquatic ecology and water quality section of the district. I focus more on what happens after the effluent is put back into the rivers. One of my main goals is to make sure that the water we put back into the rivers does not do any harm to the environment or the organisms living in it. I do this through various projects that I will go over in more detail, but they range from simply collecting and analyzing water samples to fishing and using our electrofishing backpack and boat. So um, I'm going to first discuss our whole effluent toxicity testing. The Clean Water Act was enacted in 1972 with the objective to restore the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Along with other goals, the Clean Water Act states that the national policy that the discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts be prohibited. The US EPA has pursued this goal through implementation of Water Quality Standards Program and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permitting Program through three approaches, chemical specific control, biological criteria and bioassessment, and whole effluent toxicity. The district has issued NPDES permits from the US EPA, and one of the requirements for our permit is to run acute whole effluent toxicity tests on our plant effluent. This is done by taking the treated effluent, the water is ready to be discharged into the river and expose two types of organisms in it. Whole effluent toxicity can be described as the aggregate toxic effect of aqueous samples as measured by an organism's response upon exposure to the sample, lethality, impaired growth, or reproduction. Wet tests expose aquatic or organisms to a range of effluent concentrations under controlled laboratory conditions. Exposure gen durations generally range from 24 hours to seven days. And at the end of the exposure period, biological endpoints such as survival growth or reproduction are measured in each of the concentration and control treatment. Now, besides the fact that the Clean Water Act and our NPDES permits require us to run wet tests, and even though the effluent is 99% clean, it could potentially have small amounts of chemicals in it that the EPA has not established water quality criteria for. The district collects wastewater from many different sources in lots of different industries. And we wanna make sure that any trace amounts of chemicals left behind after treatment process are not toxic when combined. So what tests measure these toxic effects using organisms representing two different trophic levels? The organisms we use are fathead minnows, um, which are less than 14 days old. So the fry pictured here, these are the adults, but these are the ones that we use for testing. And water fleas, Sarah Daphne dubia, pictured here. Organisms are then exposed to a 24 hour composite sample of diluted effluent for 24 to 72 hours. After exposure, the LC50 is calculated. LC50 is the lethal concentration where 50% of the organisms die. I'm happy to report that for the 12 years that I've been working at the district, we have never had seen any toxicity in our effluent and have always had greater than 90% survival. A lot of times the organisms exposed to our effluent do better than our control group exposed to filtered water. Next, I would like to talk about our ambient water quality monitoring chemistry program. The ambient water quality monitoring program is conducted by the district to, to fulfill NPDES permit requirements to ensure that MWRD effluent and outfalls do not cause or contribute to water quality standard violations in the waterways we discharge into. The data helps the district evaluate water quality on an ongoing basis and identify trends. A historical water quality database exists back to the program inception in 1970 before the Clean Water Act was even enacted. The Illinois Pollution Control Board designates district service area waters based on their recreational and aquatic life use potential. Monitoring is conducted on 14 water bodies at 30 sampling stations. The total number of river miles monitored is approximately 225. The rivers, creeks, and man-made can canals listed 
up here are where we conduct all the sampling all throughout Cook County. Sampling consists of lowering a bucket from a bridge or one of our patrol boats to collect the water samples. Samples are collected on a monthly basis at all 30 locations and weekly at Lockport. Aliquots containers are prepared with individual labels and sample preservatives. Samples are collected from stainless steel pail by pollution control technicians where field measurements are taken dissolved oxygen, temperature, and pH using portable meters. Bacterial samples are collected using special sampling can, which allow us to collect samples below the surface. The low-level mercury test that is conducted at the district is very sensitive, so one technician has to be designated clean hands and only touches the sample containers, while the other technician handles the sampling bucket to prevent any kind of cross-contamination. Samples are analyzed by district personnel. And here is a list of some of the analyses that are run. The next project I'd like to discuss is our continuous dissolved oxygen monitoring program. The continuous dissolved oxygen monitoring program or CDOM provides hourly water quality data throughout the year and fulfills NPDES permit requirements in the O'Brien and Calumet water reclamation plant permits. The data includes hourly dissolved oxygen, temperature, and specific conductance. Monitoring locations are within the deep draft and weightable waterways throughout the metropolitan Chicago area. There are currently 20 active monitoring stations. Monitors are deployed for four week intervals inside protective housings. District staff exchange the monitors typically from bridge locations by boat or from land. In 2020, 10 of the CDOM locations were updated with telemetry and new environmental time series data management system called Aquarius was utilized. Real-time data can be accessed by the public through the district GIS portal on our website. Here you can see a technician maintaining one of our telemetry stations. The real-time data is transmitted via cell towers where it's visible available via our website. Hourly dissolved oxygen, temperature, and connectivity measurements at 20 different locations uh, throughout the year totals over 700,000 data readings each year. In order to put more dissolved oxygen back into the water, the district operates five side stream elevated pool aeration stations or SEPA stations. SEPA 1, located near Torrance Avenue, is the closest station to the lake and is situated near a wildlife habitat, bird sanctuary, and prairie wetland. Each of the waterfalls drop three feet and the station passes up to 260 million gallons of water per day. SEPA 2 is the smallest station and is located at 127th Street. The four three-foot cascades pass 56 million gallons of water per day. SEPA 3 is located in Blue Island and is a central fixture of 8.5 acre of shady trees and park space. The circular design is divided in half with terrace planters on one side, opposing the waterfalls on the other side. This station features five foot waterfalls and a capacity of 310 million gallons of water per day. SEPA 4 in Worth is within a 12.5 acre park and attracts many visitors. In addition to the adjacent golf course, this area includes a pavilion, benches, walking paths, and bridges. Three five-foot waterfalls handle 310 million gallons of water per day. As part of the Illinois and Michigan Canal National Heritage Corridor, SEPA 5 marks the confluence of the Cal Sag and Main Channels and features a lighthouse near three-foot waterfalls and capacity of 372 million gallons of water per day making it our largest SEPA station. Here is a paper uh, that was published by some of my colleagues that show long-term trends, improvements in water quality in the region with investment in wastewater infrastructure. This paper demonstrates some of the decreases in nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, which 
um, if you know, um, contribute a lot to the uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. This paper also demonstrates decreases in suspended solids and fecal coliform. It also shows increases in dissolved oxygen. All of this monitoring and water quality improvements are looking to improve the water environment for the bi biology in the river. Which leads me to the next program I'd like to discuss, our ambient water quality monitoring biological program. The MWRD has conducted annual fish monitoring in the waterways, receiving MWRD effluence since the mid 1970s. The data collected as part of this long-term monitoring effort have demonstrated decadal improvements in numerous fish metrics due to better water quality resulting from MWRD investments. Fish are collected, identified, measured, inspected for health con and condition, and released back to the waterway. Fish data are uploaded annually to a database, which informs the public map application on the MWRD website. As the district continues to implement major infrastructure and operational improvements, such as disinfection, nutrient reduction, um, tunnel and reservoir plan, reservoirs, diversion optimization, fish community data reflects and integrates all of these changes and helps highlight environmental and societal benefits of the MWRD efforts. Annual fish collections are conducted between June and September each year. Electrofishing is a technique used by fish biologists to collect fish in freshwater streams, rivers, and lakes. Here are two are our two electrofishing boats we use to collect fish. Each boat is equipped with a DC generator in order to produce an electric field emitted from an anode to temporarily stun the fish. The fish can then be collected via dip net for identification. Typically, each side of the river is sampled for 400 meters. Before each sampling run, dissolved oxygen, temperature, and specific connectivity, as well as secchi depth readings are recorded. A secchi disk is a device used to help determine the clarity of the water. The disk is lowered into the water column until it's no longer visible. The contrasting black and white markings aids in its ability to be seen in dark water. Secchi depth is an important measure because the clarity of water impacts the amount of light penetration and in turn can affect photosynthesis and distribu distribution of organisms. While people often focus on the negative aspects of losing clarity, completely clear water is usually not desirable either because that means that the water is devoid of needed food like plankton. Here is just another uh, picture of some of our, our boats. Here is our smaller electro fishing boat on one of our smaller streams. And here is the larger uh, boat next to our other patrol boat. Now I have a video of our boat in action. Let's see if I can get it uh, working. Whoops. Yeah, so here you can see um, <clears throat> two, two netters and a uh, pilot on the back of the boat. So as the boat uh, puts an electrical current through these anodes and the bolt hull acts as a cathode, so it creates a large electric field around the whole boat. So as the fish swim into this area, they get stunned and float to the top because most fish in our area have swim bladders and float to the top. Once they are stunned, they are collected via these dip nets. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't uh, see my pointer right now. Uh, via these dip nets and are put into bins until they um, are no longer stunned. And then we can identify them, weigh and measure them. For smaller weightable streams that are too shallow for boats, we have our backpack electrofishers. The same principle is used and an electric field is produced from a smaller anode 
handheld anode, which temporarily stuns the fish to be collected by the sampling crew. This is only on a much smaller scale. The sampling range for backpack electrofishing is 40 meters, meters per side. You might be thinking, wait, electricity and water don't mix. How can we be standing in the river with an electrical field all around us? Well, we use rubber, rubber waders that insulate us from the electric current. These waders are inspected before each use to ensure there are no leaks and everybody is safe. Seining is another technique used in shallow streams. Seining involves dragging a net with lead weights at the bottom and floats on the top, which allows us to pull the net through the water column and entrap fish. After the fish are stunned or entrapped in the nets, they are put in the bins so they can go through processing. Here are some of the bins on our large electrofishing boat. Here you can see one of our research technicians and a biologist working up some of the fish we collected. They are ident identifying the fish down to species, weighing to the nearest tenth of a gram, measuring for total length to the nearest millimeter, and examining the fish for incidences of disease, parasites, and other anomalies. Following the processing, these fish will be returned live to the river. However, minnows and other small fish that are too difficult to identify will be preserved in 10% formalin and returned to the laboratory for similar processing. Here is a couple pictures of some of the fish we collect. Again, here are the bins. We use aerators in the bins because when you concentrate a lot of fish into a small area, they tend to use up a lot of the dissolved oxygen. So we have to input oxygen into those bins uh, to give them enough oxygen to breathe. Here is a long nose gar that we collected in the Des Plaines River. Here is a bowfin that we collected along with a northern pike. Here is a net full of yellow perch that was collected in the Calumet area. And these are some pictures of fish that were collected in the Calumet area as well. We have smallmouth bass, another yellow perch, Chinook salmon, and two largemouth bass. This being the largest bass that we collected on record uh, just last year. So how do we know we're doing an effective job in providing clean water? We see not only an increase in recreation along the waterways, but also an increase in aquatic life. The species of fish in the Chicago River system has grown from just a few in the 1970s all the way to 77 currently, including 60 that have been counted just since the year 2000. And according to a new study that we partnered on with the Shedd Aquarium, since 2001, a total of 19 new species were captured, of which only one mosquito fish was considered invasive. The study shows a gradual increase in both the number of fish and fish species in the Chicago waterways. Results indicate that local Chicago waterways are more ecologically productive and conducive for aquatic life and less degraded than they once were. This figure illustrates how the improved water quality co correlates to the increased number of fish. So here you can see um, lower dissolved oxygen and lower number of fish and fish species where higher dissolved oxygen and lower wastewater contaminants equals higher number of fish and higher number of fish species. <clears throat> These 77 fish species include 28 game fish and 45 native species. MWRD staff have come across a variety of fish in the cause, including the walleye, northern pike, yellow perch, grass pickerel, freshwater drum, and white and yellow bass. Other fish demonstrate the significance of water quality improvements in the cause. The banded killifish, for example, is listed by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources as a state threatened species, yet MWRD Aquatic biologists have been able to identify an increasing number of the banded killifish pulled from the cause, 
In 2014, the IDNR was conducting an electrofishing survey in the North Shore Channel and discovered a spotted gar. Spotted gar are usually found in the lower portions of the Illinois River, and this is the first time this fish has been spotted in the Chicago area waterways. One of other metrics we use to determine how water body is doing is how many fish are collected per hour. Here you can see that in the 1970s, there were less than 30 fish collected per hour. However, now at Harlem Avenue, there are over 400 fish collected per hour. Here's another paper discussing the improvements in our fish communities over the past 30 years. Now I'd like to talk about some of the special projects that we uh, help with. The Wild Mile is a project taken on by Urban Rivers and it is a mile long floating park located on North Branch Canal of the Chicago River, a man-made channel along the east side of Goose Island between Chicago Avenue and North Avenue. The completed park will consist of floating gardens with public walkways and kayak dots, docks in the Chicago River. The Wild Mile will function as a public park, open air museum, botanical garden, and kayaker destination, classroom for the community, and provide habitat for birds, turtles, and other animals above the water. But also the roots from these plants provide habitat for small fish and bugs. We conduct biological surveys before and after installation of these islands to see if the fish are utilizing them. Here is a view from the water. The MWRD constructed critical flood control and stream bank stabilization program project along Tinley Creek and Crestwood to protect homes from recurring overbank flooding. The $7.2 million project lowered flood profiles and stabilized the existing bank from active stream bank erosion through structural and natural measures. Here you can see a before picture with the stream bank erosion, lots of downed trees falling into the river because they were eroded from the stream bank. And here is the after photos. The MWRD widened and reshaped approximately 2,300 linear feet of Tinley Creek from the intersection at Calsag Road and 120th 7th Street Southwest to Central Avenue in Crestwood. New native grasses, shrubs, and trees were established along the reach of the stream to stabilize the bank, and nine in-stream rock structures were installed, as well as pools, riffles were created, not only to improve the flow of the river, but prevent flooding, but also improve habitat for local fish and benthic invertebrates. We provide pre and post construction biological monitoring to try to determine if all of this effort was effective at increasing the number of fish species and total number of fish. The project construction was completed in 2017. We haven't done any analysis with the data yet. With these type of projects, you sometimes won't be able to see any benefit until years after the project was completed and fish and benthic communities can reestablish. More biological surveys are scheduled until 2027, 10 years after completion. However, I can say that I have seen more fish utilizing the in-stream habitat, such as the ripple structures. Now, as you can imagine, it takes a wide range of talents and skills to manage our water resources from engineers in design to construction crews in hard hats to aquatic biologists like me and many scientists in the labs, lawyers, tradespeople, financial experts. There are many other professionals on hand to guide us. In fact, we have 260 positions and far more information than you can check out on our website. So as you're looking to enter the workforce, keep the district in mind. Now I would like to open it up to any questions that you guys might have. All right, so we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one's gonna be, have you found any new organisms or content in these waterways or reclamation plants with the rise of climate change? Um, we haven't um, 
looked at climate change in particular um, in regards to finding new species. Um, we haven't noticed any um, new species that wouldn't um, be found in the waterways um, because the temperatures are rising or anything like that. Um, we have found uh, new species in the waterways due to water quality improvements. Um, a lot of times degraded waterways uh, tend to host uh, more tolerant species such as carp and um, other real hardy fish and less of the um, more intolerant species uh, such as you know the banded killifish or you know smallmouth bass um, more sensitive sensitive species sensitive to water pollution um, one of our viewers is wondering have you ever found anything weird in the chicago river uh define weird uh yes we have found found all kinds of things um a lot of times uh you know it's a lot of things that were thrown into the river a lot of times near bridges so you'll find a lot of bikes um skateboards body? scooters um unfortunately um there are um instances where uh people uh pass away and if we do come across them uh we notify the local authorities and they take care of that do the stormwater in chicago does the stormwater in chicago get clean before it is returned to the ecosystem or is it like other communities where it's direct directed to surface waters so all of the stormwater um, goes through our treatment plants um, by design. However, on rare occasions when there are severe storms, um, the Chicago area is a combined sewer system. So what that means is the stormwater and the uh, sewage system are combined. So when there is so much stormwater that it overwhelms the uh, local sewers, uh, combined sewer overflows happen. Um, and that's where the stormwater and the sewage combines and uh, flows into the rivers. However, with the uh, addition of a lot of the tunnels and reservoirs, uh, such as the Deep Tunnel and the Thornton uh, Reservoir, McCook Reservoir, the combined sewer overflows has drastically reduced um, to where there is only a fraction of that happening at a time. Even with the uh, increased rainfall and climate change that we've seen, uh, we are reducing the number of CSOs that happen. Uh, how many fish do you typically call, kill when you do the electronic pulse? Um, so, Unfortunately, there is some um, inadvertent um, uh, deaths of fish when that happens, but majority of the fish are unharmed um, when we do the electrofishing. They are just temporarily stunned. Um, and then we put them in those holding tanks on the boat where we provide aerated water um, to try to prevent any stress to the fish while we are processing them and releasing them live back into the river. All right, the next question is, how do you use your research and testing to improve the quality of the waterways? So a lot of our monitoring is conducted to see how a lot of the um, improvements in the plants, uh, the water treatment plants affect the waterways. Um, so it's, it's more seeing how, how everything we've done affected the uh, biology as opposed to using the biology to um, try to make different changes. However, we do, um, we can see where there are areas uh, where there's less, less fish, um, less species richness, less diversity in the waterways. And we can use that data to target those areas 
for um, improvements such as in-stream habitat. A lot of the man-made canals uh, in the Chicago area waterway are devoid of a lot of habitat because they're just straight channels and they don't have much habitat for fish. So we can use some of the data that we collect to kind of target those hotspots and uh, find areas for improvement such as the Urban Rivers um, Wild Mile where they put in the floating uh, islands to provide habitat for uh, fish and bugs in the waterway as well as uh, birds and small mammals um, above the, the water. Um, so many questions as I know that a lot of Collar counties use Chicago water or Lake Michigan water for drinking, but the cleaned waste water is not returned to Lake Michigan will impact aquatic organisms. I'm sorry, can you uh, repeat the question? Uh, I don't know if it was a question. It just says that they know that a lot of Collar counties use Chicago water or Lake Michigan water for drinking but the cleaned wastewater is not returned to Lake Michigan because it will impact aquatic organisms. Uh, yeah, so early in the history I mentioned, um, the Chicago River flowed into the lake and a lot of the city's uh, wastewater would flow into the river and directly into the lake where the drinking water is taken from. However, the district reversed the flow of the river to prevent that. So the lake water is actually drawn into the river uh, to provide more flow downstream, uh, which all of the wastewater for the city and uh, other communities throughout Cook County uh, discharge their wastewater into the, um, after it's been treated into the rivers and then it flows downstream away from our drinking water um, intakes. All right, and the next question is, if a nearby building refuses testing or monitoring near their property, what do you do next? Um, so the district has uh, jurisdiction um, over um, all of the waterways. So we are able to go into the waterways and do any kind of sampling that we like. Um, we also have a uh, industrial waste division that is involved in um, regulating any industrial discharges into our sewer system uh, because we maintain the water treatment plants and we have to treat that, that water. So um, we have personnel who have jurisdiction to go into uh, the different industries and collect uh, samples of water and do any kind of investigations uh, that are necessary. Um, we have lawful authority to go in there and uh, collect water. Um, so, yeah, we we have jur jurisdiction to do, that, to do that because the industries are discharging their wastewater. It comes to our plant and it can affect the pollution of the, the waterways as well as um, some of the sensitive organisms that are used to treat a lot of the wastewater. Uh, if a fish or other animal is not doing well or reading bad levels due to the water, how do you treat the water or the animal? So we don't specifically treat the uh, waterways. Um, we treat the, um, the wastewater that comes in uh, to the plant. So the storm water, the sanitary water, and the industrial wastewater. We treat that. Um, I believe Someone from our microbiology section is going to talk more about that, but it involves um, exposing uh, the wastewater to a lot of um, beneficial bacteria, which uh, break down a lot of the wastes and uh, a lot of kind of settling tanks and things like that to remove a lot of the, the solids. Um, but as far as the, the waterways are concerned, you know, we monitor the waterways to see if there's any uh, pollution going on. And if we notice something, then we, we notify the proper authorities and try to investigate um, what's going on. Um, a lot of times we'll be called for 
uh, fish kills. Fish kill is um, where a stretch of the waterway uh, experiences a lot of uh, fish that die. And a lot of times um, that seems to happen when there is a uh, pollutant release, um, accidental pollutant release, or a um, lower dissolved oxygen in the waterway. Um, the fish can't, you know, escape and find an area that has higher dissolved oxygen. Uh, so they end up dying. But um, we're called out to investigate and try to find out uh, the source of the pollution and then uh, try to remedy that. All right, thank you. The next question is, if a fish or other animal is not doing well or reading bad levels due to the water. Oh, uh, next one. What do you do to restore fish populations after electromagnetic testing or fishing from tests for tests? Uh, so, like I said before, most of the uh, fish that uh, we sample um, through electrofishing are unharmed. So when we collect them, we uh, they're stunned and then they revive themselves. And then uh, we just weigh and measure them, uh, identify them and release them right back into the waterway. So we don't deplete any of the uh, local populations with our sampling. Um, regarding the Ohio train derailment, how do you think aquatic life will be affected from that long term? Um, I am, am not sure. Um, I know that when pollutants are released into the waterway, you know, there can be initial, initial spike um, in pollutant load, but that can um, dissolve um, relatively quickly. It just depends on the amount of pollutants in the area and cleanup that was um, provided. Uh, the next question is, are you removing invasives uh, as you net and electrofish? Uh, yeah, so um, when we come across invasive species that um, aren't established, um, we uh, do not release them back into the, the waterway um, so that, uh, you know, they can propagate more. Um, so anytime we come across those, we try to uh, not release those back into the, to the wild. When you collect the fish, do you ever dissect them to determine what they're eating? Um, we don't do that as part of our regular monitoring. However, we have um, uh, partnered with uh, some universities and other agencies that uh, do that it's kind of special studies. So we will provide in-kind support where we do some electrofishing, collect fish, and uh, assist with some of the um, dissecting and other kind of special projects. All right, the next question is, what is the most interesting species of fish you have found? The most interesting species of fish? Um, I don't know, they're all, they're all kind of interesting. Um, I guess um, it wasn't me um, personally, but I know we have collected, um, uh, what is the, the fish called? Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, it's a a popular fish to be eaten. Um, it's a, an exotic fish. Um, it doesn't. Um, it's not native to our to our area. Oh, I can't think of. Uh, think of the name, but a lot of people keep them um, because they're, they're very hardy fish and um, a lot of people like to eat them. And I think they were released into 
the waterway to try to establish a population. However, our waterways are not cond conducive to the to the fish, and um, you know our winters are just too cold. Uh, tilapia, that was the the name of the fish. We found a Nile tilapia um, in the waterways in the summer, but they wouldn't wouldn't be able to survive the the winters in our area. Um, one of our viewers is wondering, have you found salamanders as well? Um, we don't don't do those uh, kind of surveys. Um, we uh, survey the the waterways uh, mainly. The salamanders would be more terrestrial um, organism. Uh, so. Yeah, we we don't specifically look for those types of organisms. All right, the next um, question is, are you a specialist as an aquatic biologist? I am wondering how you know all the fish and aquatic insects, insects and all of the chemistry. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I could be considered an expert or a specialist. Um, my degree is in uh, just biology, general biology, uh, but working here at the district for 12 years, um, you know, I have studied up and uh, just experienced a lot of um, the waterways and, you know, learned a lot about the, the fish and the local uh, biology. You know, I try to read up as much as I can and uh, continue to take classes to educate myself on the local fish community. Um, as well as any emerging issues that arise. Uh, what do you do with the invasive species of fish that are found? Um, so typically we will um, jar them up, uh, put them um, into our formalin uh, to preserve them, bring them back to the lab and um, process them back at the lab. Uh, and then discard them when we are, when we're done. Does MWR, do you have an estimate for us to deal with the stormwater due to current practices? Can you repeat the question? Do we have an estimate for, uh, for the what? The damage stormwater can do always amazes me. Does MWR, do you have an estimate for us to deal with the stormwater through the current practices? Um, yeah, so with, um, you know, increasing storms and climate change on the rise, the district has implemented the uh, tunnel and reservoir plan. So the deep tunnel that runs uh, underneath Chicago uh, captures a lot of the stormwater and slowly releases it to the plants to be treated. Um, we have two uh, new reservoirs that are being completed that will increase um, the capacity for storage by billions of gallons. I'm not sure of the exact number right now. But uh, yeah, so that um, will increase, you know, the, the storage capacity for storm waters and uh, allow us to slowly treat the, the water on those big kind of flashy storms. All right, the next question is, are you finding any Asian carp getting close to Lake Michigan? So I haven't personally found any Asian carp. Um, I know there were a few individual um, fish found in Lake Calumet um, near the Calumet River, um, but we haven't noticed any established um, populations. And it seems like the... Um, the population they call it the leading edge of the um, invasive carp uh, not to be moving upstream any further. The next question is, what is the grossest part of the job? The grossest part of the job? Um, yeah, the grossest. I don't know. I, I don't find it too gross. Um, you know, I'm interested in the water and, and fish, you know, some people might think that fish are a little slimy 
and uh, not want to touch the fish, but I don't mind the, the fish slime. Um, yeah, the the only only thing that uh, might be a little bit yucky is uh, some of the contaminated sediments uh, down in the bottom of the the rivers. Um, I know uh, Bubbly Creek, um, the south fork of the south branch of the Chicago River, has a lot of contaminated sediments um, that you don't want to uh, really disturb or dig up. Uh, that's where a lot of uh, dumping was happening, you know, back in the uh, early, you know, 19th century. Um, so a lot of legacy contaminants in the sediments um, uh, is, I guess you could say, the grossest part. Uh, so many questions asked, is the MWRD regulatory or advisory? Um, so we are uh, regulated by the EPA and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, but we also have a um, a branch of our of the district that is regulatory on industries. So our industrial waste division uh, they regulate what those industries can discharge into the the sewer system, and if they um, are polluting too much or using too much water, um, they will be fined uh, by the district and charged for polluting. And yeah, so our industrial waste division enforces a lot of those regulations. Science for Our Future asks, has climate change affected the quantity of water being managed by the WRD? Um, yeah, I don't know about um, total water, um, if that has uh, changed throughout the years, but I know um, we have seen an increase in, in storms. So a lot of the, the storm waters and the, the duration of the storms, the amount of the, the storms uh, seems to increase. Um, so we have seen a rise in that. Um, and then again, we're addressing that through the tunnel and reservoir plan uh, to initiate those, those large reservoirs to capture those storm water. Um, that storm water before it uh, is released into the waterway. Have you ever found a snakehead fish? No, no snakeheads in this area. Uh, so many questions asked, what are some ways we can protect our waters and the organisms that live in them? Um, yeah, so uh, just, you know, good, good practices. Uh, don't throw toxic chemicals down the drain. You know, recycle your paint, recycle. Um, uh, or not recycle your paint, but dispose of old paint properly. Um, you know, the uh, sewer is not just a, a garbage disposal, you know, be mindful what you put in there. Um, any kind of medications, um, don't just flush those down the toilet, don't throw those away, you know, take those. Um, a lot of um, places have um, prescription take back days. Uh, so disposing of prescription, unused prescriptions properly. Uh, what else? Just be mindful of how much water you use. Um, you don't want to be wasteful with water. Um, another, you know, kind of new big initiative is chlorides. So salt, um, you know, in the wintertime, a lot of road salt is being used. Um, you don't need to use that much salt. Uh, on your driveways or sidewalks, if any. So just be mindful of how much uh, salt you put on the waterway or on the, the driveways because eventually the salt goes into the, the snow melts, washes into the sewers, and then eventually gets into the waterways. And that could do harm to, to fish as well. Um, and then also on big major storm events, uh, try not to use, use so much water. Um, 
that can overwhelm some of the the local uh, sewer systems when you're adding stress to those systems in an already stressed out system from the storms. Um, yeah, I think those are a few few good practices. All right, that's about all the questions we had. We do just want to say thank you again for the uh, insight on uh, the rivers and, uh, and thank you to all the attendees who uh, participated and asked questions. Um, I do have to say the National Biodiversity Teaching uh, is a student project that happens because we have so many partners supporting us. One of those partners is Earth Echo International. Uh, we are excited to partner with Earth Echo International to promote an opportunity to empower our peers across the country. This year, Earth Echo is excited to open the Our Echo Challenge uh, STEM competition to students in the US. 10 finalist teams will advance for a chance to win top prizes of $1,000, uh, $2,500, and $5,000. If you have any questions, please email us. And that's going to be it. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. No problem.